So our first panelist today is Maurizio Montalti, um, and his practice, of, um, I'm, I'm terrible at pronunciation, and my best friend is Italian and would kill me, Offici Officina Corp Corpuscoli. Yeah, yeah, it's okay, yeah. Um, seeks to reveal unorthodox relationships among existing paradigms. Wow, that sounds very, very deep. You're going to have to explain that out for us a little bit. Uh, Maurizio holds a master's in industrial engineering from Bologna, as well as a master's in conceptual design in context from the Design Academy, Eindhoven. He is a co-founder of Mycoplast, a company focused on industrial scale-up of mycelium-based materials. We're talking fungi, basically, aren't we? Great. I love mushrooms, so this is very, very exciting to me. Um, and he's currently co-heading the Mad Master Materialization in Art and Design at Sandberg Institute. Maurizio. Thank you for your kind introduction and thanks to the Craft Council for having invited me here today. It's really a honor to be here and I thank you all for being present and listening to my story. Um, as, uh, as it was said, um, I'm actually, my name is Maurizio um, and I'm the founder and director of a, a design transdisciplinary studio based in Amsterdam, which is called Officina Corpuscoli. Just to give you a short heads up about uh, uh, what that stands for, Officina in Italian uh, actually is the workshop, is the place where you bring your car to repair. It's a mechanical workshop. While Corpuscoli, you can understand it from the very root, the Latin root of the word, corpus, the body, and Corpuscoli, you could say they are the little body. So it's the workshop where you engage with and work with the little bodies. So today what I want to do is to give you a little bit of an outline of uh, uh, the work I've been carrying out with, uh, I've, I've been carrying on with along the uh, last years uh, in direct collaboration with uh, organisms which are other than humans, uh, but microorganisms indeed, uh, fungi. And uh, actually, I want to conduct you through a little bit of a story where I want to highlight uh, the different kind of coincidental opportunities, which is very important to look at along the uh, development uh, process of a project, uh, which actually could arise and that particularly are relevant when different fields of application, uh, different fields of action uh, come together as in a positive marriage. Well, my story begins a little bit from uh, uh, an obsession. As a designer, I've been uh, uh, taught and encouraged to work with matters at hand. Uh, so I was finding myself on a daily basis in a workshop uh, working with uh, um, synthetic materials, mostly plastics, foams, and so on. And I was actually tremendously frustrated as a designer in needing to do so because I was actually working on developing uh, ideas or even not ideas of products which eventually would come in the market and that I was very much aware uh, of the impact they could have been originating, they could have been creating, the negative impact actually from an environmental point of view. And now I don't have to spend too many words about this. You are all very aware about uh, the, the very severe consequences that uh, uh, synthetic materials and specifically plastics are having on our ecosystem. And I'm not here to demonize plastics either because plastics are a fantastic material. It's not the problem, about, the problem is not about the material itself. Plastics are the materials of possibilities. Plastics are the materials that allowed modernity to happen in the way we know it. But the problem is not the material is us and is the way we make use of such uh, great potential that these materials uh, offer. However, in society we are all very familiar with a certain attitude that we uh, actually um, carry on with, which is this, uh, this attitude rooted in disposability. And uh, when we dispose of plastic materials, uh, uh, they usually gets dump get dumped in a landfill uh, where there's no possibility for degradation to take place and they gradually enter uh, the food chain and they start becoming background, the part of the background chemistry of our bodies and of the bodies of the whole ecosystem, uh, not to be focused only on humans. So, uh, actually, this is quite uh, severe. This is a very uh, mm, meaningful 
picture to me. It's a bit of a macabre mirror. It's not my work. It's a work from a, a British photographer called Chris Jordan, which was documenting the death of uh, Baby Albatross uh, in a very remote island, remote atoll in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, really far from any coast. And basically what he documented was the, the death of uh, such birds which were fed by their mother, which was mistaking food uh, and actually mistaking plastic for food, so was feeding uh, the babies with such uh, plastic bits. And so what happens is that when uh, inevitably the chicks die, their stomach, while they decompose, their stomach gets exposed, and this is the not very happy surprise that you see inside. And this is not just what's happening to the birds, that's what's happening to all of us. Now, uh, to come back to fungi, why did I start ever to work with, uh, in collaboration, as I like to say, with such amazing organisms? Now, if you think about it, fungi are everywhere. They are in the air we breathe. In this very moment, we are breathing millions and millions of fungal spores. They are everywhere we step. It's like if you go outside and you walk, it's actually all the soil is full of fungal mycelium going on everywhere and nevertheless we humans uh, tend to associate these microorganisms with feelings of disgust of repulsion we actually think they are the origin of diseases and well it is true partly that some of the fungi are pathogenic but this is a great minority you have to think about the fact that uh, uh, we think that there are about five millions of different fungal species in the world and actually most of them can be extremely beneficial for us. Uh, so, to give you a little bit of a background knowledge, not to make a biology lesson, but when we talk about fungi, and it's easy to distinguish in English when where you talk about fungi and mushrooms, fungi are not the fruiting bodies, are not the reproductive body of, of, of the organism. Fungi are actually the vegetative body of this, and it's a very, very extended uh, organism which actually goes on in the soil and inside every uh, decaying and dying matter. These are just the manifestations uh, which are there for reproductive reasons. So you have to think about, for instance, the tree being the organism and the apple being the fruit of the tree. In the same way, the mushroom is the fruit of a larger organism, which, however, is hidden. And where is it, in fact? It's, it's just underground, mostly. And uh, it consists of this very intricate uh, uh, net of interlocking cells. Uh, this was supposed to be a video, but unfortunately it's not a video anymore in the PDF, but that doesn't matter. These are kind of fungal cells. They are these filamentous cells that uh, uh, actually uh, go on ever in any kind of uh, uh, decaying matter and that uh, uh, tend to intersect with each other until they form sort of unwoven structures. They form a very intricate net. So some people, in fact, tend to talk about such organisms as the first uh, uh, web well, literally, but natural internet in the world. We might be familiar, or you might be familiar with uh, such organisms. When you take a walk uh, in the woods, you might uh, have spotted this kind of fluffy, white, cotton-like substances which grow on decaying uh, matter. And now, I, I encourage you to notice the scale. This is a one centimeter scale. Uh, but in fact, this is a cluster of thousands and if sometimes millions of fungal filamental cells because the reality is in fact that they are uh, really not possible to, to be witnessed by naked eye usually, if not through microscopy. So my question back in time was like, how could we engage in a beneficial uh, relationship with fungal organisms? How could we actually trigger a symbiosis somehow between human and fungi? And uh, uh, triggered by that question and motivated by not the will of creating new materials or new materialities, I was actually at the time very interested in uh, analyzing topics related to death, so something completely different. But I was interested in fungi exactly because fungi are the great recyclers of the natural worlds. They undergo cycles of transformation, transmutation of organic matter to be rendered into nutrients that can go back to uh, the ecosystem for favoring the emergence of new life forms. So I started playing on my own and just uh, uh, trying to understand what I was trying to talk about. I am a designer, so I need, in order to know what I'm talking about, I need to experience the matter. I need a very hands-on approach. And uh, uh, things started changing dramatically when I was welcomed uh, um, 
in, uh, in, in a lab, which is actually still nowadays the lab where I'm working uh, uh, in, and it's at the, in the, at the microbiology department at uh, the University of Utrecht under the supervision of Professor Han Vosten. And uh, at that point, I actually finally could, uh, um, in a good way, start experimenting with the, these organisms, starting monitoring their behavior, st starting understanding how they grow, how they behave, how they change, what's their action, on different matters. So I started growing them in very many different uh, uh, kind of uh, situations, different media, looking at their interaction with uh, conventional materials. In this case, you are looking at uh, uh, fungi growing on uh, different kind of textile uh, matters. Uh, I, I wanted actually to look at the possibility of utilizing fungi for degrading plastics. And in fact, that partly succeeded. So as a, as a uh, beginning of my um, marriage or my, my, my kind of exploration uh, on this about this topic, I actually uh, developed a couple of projects which I'm not going to focus on right now, but I just show you very briefly, uh, which in fact uh, uh, were looking at the possibility of degrading matter, of getting rid of uh, existing matter, both organic matter, as you see here, but also and particularly inorganic matter, where I was using fungi to degrade some, uh, some typologies of plastics. So the idea at that time, my objective as a designer was not to introduce something else in the world, something else for the consumer, but actually to try and contribute to identify ways to get rid of stuff. And this was the idea, so how can I activate a material? How can I uh, um, allow an inanimate object to come to life? Can I actually infuse the fungus in something that is a never lasting but dead material, bring it to life and trigger a process of final dissolution and death? And this was in fact uh, the result at that time. But maybe we can talk later about it in a more informal way. Uh, my greatest focus was, however, and has always been, this kind of transition, this process of transmutation from one form to another. Uh, something that hardly we can witness uh, in, uh, when it comes to synthetic materials. So for me it's interesting to outline how in time my uh, working environment started to dramatically change. Because again, I'm a designer. But uh, all of a sudden this became my desk space, this became my tools, and this became my atelier, my, 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 works, my, my, my workshop. Uh, now my studio is not just like this, but this is definitely the space where I tend to mostly operate. So very rich from the experience that I gathered, I felt uh, empowered, I felt like I had an opportunity that maybe other people might not have. So I wanted to share as much as I could uh, all the know-how that I, I, I had gathered. Still, I'm not a scientist nowadays and I do not want to become, but all of a sudden I knew how to work with tools that usually do not belong to the design practice. So I started giving workshops, working in collaboration with different cultural institutions, uh, in Amsterdam mainly, uh, to name few, sticking the Mediamatic Foundation and uh, the Vag Society, and uh, building uh, by following like biohacking principles, building different tools to enable uh, citizens, but particularly in this case creatives, to approach the scientific subject and the scientific materials and start learning working with them. This in order also to create a community, a community that could uh, contribute uh, to a quicker pace towards the fact of identifying real uh, ways for uh, maybe creating alternatives. This was, for instance, a very interesting project, which was a, a funded project where we had the opportunity, and we was uh, Mediamatic Foundation, the University of Utrecht, and my studio, of involving uh, uh, other like-minded uh, designers and artists to whom certain materials that we developed uh, were given and that could eventually, that, and, and such designers and artists could uh, uh, start uh, collaborating, carrying on, on on the research, carrying on also part of the research and embedding such materials in specific applications. So it's interesting when you come actually to, from this micro scale, uh, actually working with living materials is not just working on petri dishes, you can work on many different levels. And a very interesting uh, uh, dimension that uh, arised in time was the fact of working more on a macro level, was the, the idea of working with 
waste in a very uh, different kind of uh, attitude, which is much more related to farming than to microbiology. So again, here you see different kind of fields of action coming and interact and intersect on a side farming, on, on, a, on, a, on the other side science and microbiology, on the other side design and art. And uh, uh, eventually this is what in the last years I have been doing, starting growing materials, great quantities of materials. And uh, uh, why is this so stimulating for me? Because all this uh, process uh, of growing materials, which I'm going to tell you a little bit more about now in a few minutes, is rooted in the idea of valuing uh, existing resources, but resources that are in fact uh, considered as waste. So the process I'm talking about fully relies on implementing any kind of waste coming, in this case, mostly from the agricultural industry, but also from the manufacturing industry, any kind of plant matter, any kind of organic material that contains mostly cellulose and sugars, to be transformed in something else, in something with a new value, to be scaled up. And here uh, I would like just to, to let you understand a little bit more effectively what I'm trying to talk about. Uh, I'd like to show you uh, a video which uh, is a work which was commissioned to fellow artist Wim van Egmond for a recent exhibition which I curated and uh, it illustrates uh, uh, the skills the, the, and the behavior of fungal, in this case very selected, targeted fungal organisms growing on waste. So what basically fungi do is uh, feeding on uh, the nutrients to be found within this waste matter and by uh, actually extending their cells they are partly degrading degrading this material and so and they are transforming this material they are transforming the material in a in a uh, natural polymer which is actually chitin chitin is the same polymer which makes up the exoskeletons of marine life such as shrimps for instance to make it clear and on the other side the fungal mycelium or the fungal hyphae, which are the cells, act as a living glue, as a binding agent which puts together all those waste particles in a cohesive matter. Uh, we can actually also uh, go back to the presentation because the video is quite long. Yeah. Uh, it is interesting actually to, to think about uh, the fact that all of a sudden the, f the idea of working, if you can go to, oh no, if that's me, to the next slide, uh, the idea of working uh, uh, with uh, living organisms promotes also the emergence of uh, a completely different idea of what production can be, of how production can be conceived. In this case, this is the possibly the very first brick I ever grew, which was a great satisfaction. What I love about this is the fact that uh, it has such um, a different quality from what we are used to. You know, we are used to this kind of slick finishes, perfected materials, while here the material is speaking the, the language of the process that brought it to life. And that is for me, as part of my studio practice, something extremely fundamental. So all of a sudden a new uh, paradigm of production started to emerge for me. A paradigm which is not based anymore uh, on, on traditional means of production, but it's fully based on growth and cultivation. That's a little bit what I like to define as growing design, which is nothing else than the reactualization of a, of a very old practice, such as agriculture, transported back to contemporary times and not uh, targeting food consumption, but the generation of matter and the related products and applications. It is interesting also because there are multiple variables which can allow you to grow a great variety of materials because you can choose different kind of waste streams, you can choose different fungal species and different fungal strains and each fungus behaves tremendously differently. You can vary the environmental conditions in which you grow the materials and you can treat the materials after having grown them in order to stop the growth and to deactivate the material, to render it inert. And the intersection of all those parameters gives you as a result a different typology of material with different mechanical properties but also very different experiential qualities when it comes, for instance, to textures. 
So this is just to illustrate the, the difference of, uh, yeah, of the, the textures. Uh, in time, like this project became um, generated a collection of objects which uh, uh, are in fact part of uh, the growing lab mycelia collection and they consist of very um, simple volumes in this case you see mostly vases bowls vessels uh, of, of different kind they are archetypical objects and that was a deliberate decision on a side because i was bound at the time to the fact of working with uh, uh, molds so very very determined kind of shapes that i wanted to let emerge because of course the technology has offered some opportunities but has also certain limitations it's difficult actually to imagine working with injection molding uh, with such materials, despite the fact that that's something we are trying to do. But at the same time, the point was like uh, uh, not trying to put too much of myself in there. It was not about me. It was not about my signature as a designer. It was about letting fungi speak and letting certain simple shape be signifiers for uh, and, and testifiers of the emergence of a process. So again, these are just different uh, images from uh, the collection, which is also consists of tiles and panels and furniture pieces, which we are also currently developing at the studio. But I come back to this image because it's very meaningful to me, uh, as it shows the potential. So what you see that I've been working at at the studio, you could say is craft. So some, somehow you, you, you start from uh, science and science approached with, in a very unorthodox manner through the eyes, the mind and the hands of a designer and you come to the fact of developing a craft which utilizes living matters. But then all of a sudden you find yourself as a designer having these fantastic conversations within the cultural field, with galleries, with musea. It's really exciting and everybody is very happy. And then you realize that actually you're not doing anything. You're just, despite the tangibility of it, it's just a story. And for me, it's very important that uh, I strongly think that designers hold a great responsibility in being uh, the means, the, the main catalyzers of change. So I decided to embark in a bit of a crazy adventure. Uh, and at the beginning of 2015, uh, despite the fact that, yes, yeah, some part of some industry showed interests, uh, but nobody was really ready to invest, I, I decided to start my own company and to try and scale up the production of specific mycelium based materials and products and such company uh, as uh, it was said before yeah the growing factory um, is uh, is called Mycoplast and it's a company which is currently based uh, in north of Italy but strongly active in Europe through partnerships partnerships with different research centers universities and industrial partners and uh, uh, we are developing a set of products which is called Mogu. Uh, we started targeting very many different markets uh, and then we started focusing on three main ones, one being the one of horticulture uh, and this by actually working in direct consultation with clients which were expressing a need. So it's not us looking for what to do, it's the client coming and saying I have a problem. I have a waste stream, I have costs, I don't know what to make of it, what can we do? And so this is just an example of something we are developing, but it's not our strongest focus at the moment, but the idea is the one of developing a biodynamic vase, a vase that becomes one with a plant, that fits the plant, that can go in the soil with the plant. And if you think about the enormous amount of EPS vases, which are uh, daily disposed of in the horticulture industry, that's actually really uh, tragic. Uh, and uh, yeah, another thing we were tackling was packaging, like our American cousins are doing since quite a few years. There's a company in the States that is very active in, uh, in working with uh, uh, mycelium-based composites for, for packaging. But actually, these are very low added value products also. So it's big volumes, uh, low costs, uh, and uh, it's a little bit of a problematic product. And what we actually stumbled upon by also working and borrowing technologies from existing industries, such as the plastic industry, is the development of uh, uh, new materials which actually are born 
uh, are basically uh, engineered woods, you could say, uh, naturally engineered wood, which do not contain formaldehyde, do not contain any toxic glue, but where the only living, once living, binding agent is the fungus. And these materials can be highly performative. They have great mechanical properties and they have great uh, properties also when it comes to uh, insulation values in terms of thermal insulation or acoustic insulation. What is really interesting for me uh, in this product and what I like to emphasize is the fact that once again it was born from a necessity of uh, one of our industrial partners which has uh, basically is producing textiles. And uh, uh, the amount of waste that is produced on a daily basis for manufacturing textile is insane. And so we are basically feeding the fungi with the textile and we are trans transforming the loose textile fibers, if not even trimmings of uh, um, existing garments, into materials, in this case into uh, elements for bioarchitecture and for interior design. Um, and I'll just quickly also come to the end. Yeah, also we are growing bricks. Uh, I want to show you another family of materials which uh, arised uh, during, uh, during our research process because what I showed you until now are the composites, so the mix between a fiber and the fungus, you could say. But in fact, there's a range, a very interesting range of other materials which exclusively consist of fungal mycelium uh, and could be seen as potential replacement for other traditional matters such as, for instance, leather, in this case EPS, in this case rigid plastic, or wood-like materials, or again textile-like materials which have a, a pretty good degree of flexibility, still quite fragile at this moment, but we're working on improving them, um, and so on and so on, or leather-like materials. And uh, we also started actually embedding these materials into applications, into tangible products uh, by actually also machining them, trying to understand how we could use different kind of prototyping technologies for changing uh, their, their behavior, uh, while at the same time by embedding them in different kind of uh, uh, very well-known application and products such as in this case, this is a little bit of a different material because it comes out of uh, um, the, 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 a fruiting body, a mushroom, but in this case, yeah, okay, a, a bag or shoes, for instance, or books. So in this case, we are really thinking about how, which kind of products utilize leather and how could we uh, learn on improving the material by actually directly prototyping. So it's a very much uh, a process of learning by doing. I very briefly refer to uh, this uh, project we are carrying on with, which is uh, um, actually a collaborative project where we are working uh, uh, together with uh, a fab lab in Turin, the first Italian fab lab, and a team of computational designers and architects, and where we are intersecting uh, biological computation, so the fungal growth, with digital computation, so the algorithms that we feed the machine with, and with robotic behavior, and we, where those three systems actually inform each other and learn from each other. It's a sort of 4D additive manufacturing where the uh, element of time is added to the three dimensions because the fungus also takes a certain degree of autonomy in letting us the, uh, the favoring the emergence of a certain uh, final product. And it's also informing actually a project that we are conducting now with the European Space Agency which looks at possibilities for space colonization, which I'm also partly critical about. Uh, I just want to leave you with uh, uh, images of an exhibition which uh, uh, was a curatorial project I realized earlier this year uh, and it was called Fungal Futures, Growing Domestic Biolandscapes. It's a, a project which uh, started in Utrecht uh, at the, in the Botanical Garden of the uh, Utrecht Universiteitsmuseum and is currently on show in Enschede in the east of the Netherlands uh, at the Museum Twentse Welle. And what I uh, liked 
as part of this project was the fact of trying and make a little bit of uh, a point about the state of the art when it comes to this very specific theme, which is the use of fungi and mycelium in art and design. So trying and outline what people, what artists and designers had been realizing so far with such uh, living materials. And so the, the projects range from uh, installations to uh, different kind of uh, uh, products uh, and, like, for instance, uh, touching upon fashion. This is a project from Aniela Hoyting, which is also a speaker tomorrow morning and should be possibly also here in the room. Uh, and uh, shoes, uh, and again, uh, anthropomorphic sculptures, uh, stools, uh, um, and so on. Uh, yeah, architectural studies. What I really liked about this project is the fact that it's not just about showing the objects, but it's about, again, questioning from a cultural point of view uh, what the emergence of such new paradigm triggers, particular, particularly when it comes to the way in which also things are exhibited. Because clearly, I, the, it, there was a deliberate will in uh, going out of the usual frame of the, the white cube and actually what a better place than a greenhouse for hosting uh, a number of projects which are rooted uh, around the concept of growth. And this is Firos and his bricks. And so I just want to uh, leave you with a reflection. I think everything uh, is or at least should be uh, material ready for transformation and change into other uses and forms. And I think actually this is one opportunity that fungal materials as well as many other uh, biomaterials could, could bring about. And uh, I hope to have partly infected also your minds with interest in this subject and I thank you for your attention.